Okay, the rest of us, we're going to gather around God's word. Can we just stand together and let's just all look to the Lord. You know, we're here to hear from the Lord, here to read his word. Look at what his word really means, apply it to our lives. This is not entertainment, this is not just something interesting, it's the word of God. God says his word will give us life and power, it will transform our lives, but it will also challenge and correct and even rebuke, because none of us are perfect, so we always have to be open to what God's word speaks to us. Father, thank you for this precious word, the word that you sent to us because you love us. Even when you correct and rebuke us, Lord, you do it because you love us. And so, Lord, thank you for the, the whole encompassing total power of this word from beginning to end. May we grasp some of it this morning so it can come into our hearts, transform our lives, and give us power to live for you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you'd like to take your seats. Okay. Uh, rather something unusual I'm going to do now. I'm going to preach a message I've already preached. It's a message I preached last uh, summer. Um, now the reason is this, I, uh, it's something that I've received guidance from the Lord upon. When I was praying in January, uh, during the time of prayer and fasting, the Lord revealed to me things uh, I needed to do this year. Uh, and one of the things was this. He wanted me to preach this again, but do it as a series rather than just one message. I did it just as one message last year. Um, and so having received that from the Lord, I then wait for confirmation. And uh, I preached this message when I was in India a couple of times. And uh, I think Lee was said to me, you, you ought to do a series on that. So I got my confirmation from a couple of sources. And so I'm going to preach a message you've heard before. And then over the next 10 weeks or so, I'm going to take parts of this message and do exposition on it so that we can understand more of what this message means. Because it's a message that's actually all the way through the Bible, as all true messages from God are. They're continuously backed up all the way through the Bible. Uh, now the message is, um, it's the story of the garden. Uh, I, I don't know who can remember when I preached on the garden. Yeah, last summer. Put your hand up if you can remember it. Oh, most of you can't, so that's okay. It'll be a fresh message for you. I have mentioned it a couple of other places up at Hollybush, and uh, I think the day of prayer I mentioned it as well. But I want us to look at the garden of God. There's a very specific reason for that. Uh, can we go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8? Now, over the coming weeks, hopefully we'll see what this word, this message in God's word really means. Because it's not just a story of something that happened a long time ago. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8, and just read all the way, we'll read all the way down to verse 20. Now, I'm sure you know the story. Uh, in chapter 1, God describes the creation of heavens and earth during that sevenfold process. God always works in a sevenfold process. And then in chapter 2, he goes, in, he goes into greater detail about what he does now. He's created the earth after that seven days. And he gives greater detail in chapter 2 about some of the specifics of what he does. And he also gives us information about something he must have done in the seven days of creation that he didn't tell us about in chapter 1. The most obvious one of these is he created a garden. Now, he doesn't tell us that in chapter 1, but in chapter 2 he tells us that he's already done it. He has to because that's where he puts the man. So, let's just read this story about what God thinks is so important. He spends a whole chapter describing it straight after creation. This is, this is the information God gives us after creation, okay? So, starting at verse 8, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden 
were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. So it became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur, that's Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates, which we know today runs through Iraq. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. We'll stop there. The more you read this, the more you get revelation on what God's original plan was and what God wants to do. And the more you read it, the more you start to notice things. Uh, simple things like Adam was in the garden before Eve, which I'm sure you already knew. But how long was he in the garden before Eve? Because he's naming all the animals and he's with God and God's not found a suitable helper. And God twice says he didn't find a suitable helper. And so he, he, he can't find a suitable helper. So then he brings Adam all the animals, but none of those are suitable helpers. So then he goes on to create the bride. It's a very prophetic revelation God's trying to show us of what his plan is for mankind but we'll come on to that in the coming weeks the important thing that I want us to see this is just an introduction really for the series we're going to be doing over the next few weeks so I'm just giving us an introduction some principles of understanding what the garden is the first thing the obvious thing is God created a garden before he created man yeah we read that at the beginning. Can you go back to verse 8? Genesis chapter 2 and verse 8. Now the Lord God had, past tense, planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man. So when God created the man, he put him in a garden God had already created. Yeah? Straightforward. But it's very illuminating. Because that means God already had a place to put... The man he created. Now, if that was God's plan in the beginning, you'll find it's God's plan all the way through. God has already prepared for us, even in the New Testament, works to do, places to be. God's very clear about that. That's not something that's going to happen. That's something God's already prepared. That doesn't mean you'll be there. No one's in the garden. They left the garden. They, they lost the place that God had created for them. The most perfect place that God had created for Adam and Eve, they lost. God's plan is a place. Do you really believe that? Because in my experience, most Christians don't. Most Christians just think of their relationship with God and what that'll do for them and maybe what they'll get out of that. But God's plan is always a place. All the way through the Bible. Go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abraham, past tense again, Go from your country and your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. God had already prepared a land for Abraham. 
And you'll find all the patriarchs, all the way through the Bible, all the way through the New Testament even, as well as the Old Testament, God has a specific place where he wants to put people. That's not changed. You have to be where God puts you, not where you want to be. Now, that doesn't mean you always know what's going on. Sometimes God might move you from somewhere and you not understand, but as long as you are trusting God, following God, believing God. Remember, you know, when we read the life of Abraham, it says Abraham went forth not knowing where he was going, but he, know, he knew he was following God to the place God had prepared for him. He, he didn't know where that was. He'd never been, but he did get there. And all the blessings and all the promises that God had for Abraham only would take place once Abraham was in the place God put him. God had prepared for him. Can you see that? God will make him into a great nation, but only if he's in the right place. You know, he will bless him, but only if he's in the right place. Make you a name great, but only if he's in the right place. Abraham would birth the nation of Israel, but Israel is a place. You can't have the blessing if you're not in the place that God's put you. You will be a blessing. Bless those who bless you, curse you, curse you, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. And that is a place. Have you noticed throughout history, anyone who's cursed Israel gets cursed? You look at any nation that's tried to, you know, anti-Semitism, attack the Jews, you watch what happens to them. They practically get obliterated themselves. Doesn't mean God can't restore. And so we've got this principle of God creating a place. A place that he created before he created you. Now, let's, what is that place? Where is that place? Because although Adam and Eve fell and left Eden, the story of the Bible is that God is still emphasizing this place. This place where he can meet with us. This place where we can be. Now, what happened in Eden? Let me, let me tell you the first thing that happened in Eden. God met his wife in Eden. Sometimes we don't think about that. If Adam wasn't in Eden, he might not have got the bride, Eve. Because it's only when he was in Eden and God brought the animals and started doing stuff in Eden, it's only then that God said, you haven't got a bride while he was there. So God created Eve. So community for Adam, relationship started because he was in the right place. Now, obviously, he had a relationship with God because God is talking to him right from the beginning. God is bringing the animals to him. God is communicating with him. God is sharing with him, but only because he's in the place where God puts him. But then he also meets the bride. You've got to understand it's not just about your relationship with God. We emphasize that so much because it's true. Obviously, you are saved to have a relationship with God. But what about your relationships with others? Once he had his relationship with God in the right place, God then said, you need other people. Now, he brought him all the animals, and he said, no, that's not enough. Now, the animals, Adam could use as slaves, you know, he could use the ox to plow uh, the fields, he could use the donkeys to carry the loads, he could, I don't know, use the monkeys to get his coconuts, whatever. <laughs> you know, he could... I, I'm sure he liked animals. Animals are lovely. We love animals. God created them. But God says you need more than that. You need community. You need family. Because at the end of the uh, previous chapter and in, and in chapter 2, it says you will be fruitful and multiply once he has Eve. So, but all this is in Eden. So it's only because he's in the right place that God creates a community in that place. So he brings Eve. So you've got Adam meeting with God, but you've also got Eve there. They are both. It is a e Eden. Isn't just a place you meet with God. It's a place where we meet with God. Do you get that? Don't overemphasize your personal relationship with God and forget about the corporate relationship with God, which is God's real aim. 
Jesus would tell his disciples, you need to have a secret place where you go and meet with God. He emphasized that with the, you know, our, our secret place, our, our place where we have our devotions and where we pray to the Lord. That's, we must have that. But then Jesus would always take his disciples away with him and together they would meet with God. And he emphasized that just as much. So Eden is the place, not just where you can meet with God individually, it's a place where community, the fellowship of believers, those who know the Lord can meet with God. Can you see that? That's what Eden was. He wasn't on his own in Eden. It was where God's plan was he would bring up his family. It was where God's plan was he would get married. It was God's plan that the community would come out of that place, this place of Eden. It is a corporate meeting place. Now you'll notice where we're going with this. Because God hasn't changed his mind about that. Just because they blew it and lost Eden, God just put another plan in action of creating the same thing. Jesus' final prayer was that all the believers would be united together and meet with God. And when you go to the end of the Bible, that's what you find. You find a community. In fact, we looked at it a little bit there in, in chapter 19 of Revelation, where the bride is described as a city full of people. It's not one individual. It's a community of people that belong to God. That's who his bride is. And at the end of the Bible in Revelation, you'll notice that the Garden of Eden is back. Everything that was in the Garden of Eden is back at the end of Revelation. The Tree of Life, the River of Life, this Garden Paradise, it's called. Paradiso in Greek. So can you see God's plan is still the Garden he hasn't changed his plan. That's what's coming, as well as that is what was originally. So I, I want to just lay this foundation today of understanding some basics about the garden, just so we've got that, so that in the coming weeks we can look at that. But the main thing you need to understand is God isn't going to change his mind about the garden. Yeah? yeah. So are you going to be in the garden or not? Do you want to be in the garden? Yeah. Do you like people? Because there's people in the garden. You know, we'd all love the garden if it were just us and God, wouldn't we? And then God would just have to put up with us. But no, there's other people in the garden. There were animals in the garden as well. There's, there's this corporate nature of the garden, and I want us to see that. Because today there's an emphasis on the non-community of God and the individuality. You know, you, you will all hear people say, you, you, don't have to believe in, you don't have to go to church to believe in God. You've heard people say that? Have you said it? If you are, you're dumb, but, so don't say it again, right? Because you don't have to be in the garden to believe in God. Did Adam and Eve believe in, the gar believe in God after they were cast out of the garden? Yes. So they were in community relationship with God in the same way? No. They'd lost everything. But we still believe in God. Were they still saved? It's an interesting theological debate, isn't it? Were Adam and Eve still saved after they were cast out of the garden? What do you think? I, I don't see why not. God, God created skins of covering to cover their sin. There was a sacrifice given, a blood sacrifice. Adam and Eve believed in that blood sacrifice because they put the garments on. Yeah? So there's no reason to doubt that, you know, they weren't saved. They didn't still have saving faith in God. So they were still in the garden. No, they weren't in the garden. God's emphasis is the garden. Not whether you get into heaven or not. I mean, heaven is the garden, so that's a bit of a paradox. So what happened in the garden? If you go to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, you know, one of the obvious things that happened in the garden... Genesis 3 and verse 8. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. So, first obvious thing that happens in the garden. God comes into the garden to walk with Adam and Eve. Yeah? Does God still want to do that? 
Does God want to walk with us? He walks with us and he talks with us along life's narrow way. Yes, of course he does. If there's one thing you'll notice about Jesus in the life in the Gospels is that he walked about an awful lot. I mean, sometimes I'm sure he just went for a walk for the sake. Because he'd walk somewhere or go on a boat trip somewhere or walk up a mountain and then they'd get there and he'd say, right, let's go back. Yeah. You think, that's just great, that is. I've just rode across Galilee, you know, 12 miles, whatever it is, the farthest stretch. And we've got here and you've said, right, let's go back. It's like, what was the point in that? Do you know what the point was? He just wanted to be with them. It's like going camping. Yeah. yeah, there is no point in camping, right? We know that. The, the fun of camping is just being together. Yeah, that's the fun of camping. Walking with them, being with them. Do you know that phrase is never spoken of with Adam and Eve after they left the garden? Now, he still talked to them, but he didn't walk with them. Now remember he created the whole earth in seven days and he told Adam and Eve that they could go into the whole earth yeah, to, to rule over it, to conquer it, to subdue it. So it wasn't, God wasn't restricting them saying, yo, you've got to stay in my garden and you can't do anything else. He, no, he never said that. They could go over all the earth. But he only walked with them in the garden. His meeting place with them was in this special place. And after they left the garden, they lost that. If you go to Genesis 5, verse 22, in the first 2,000 years of human history, the first 2,000 years in the Bible, there are only two people that walked with God. There are only two people mentioned. There's lots of people mentioned. There's entire genealogies and descriptions of entire people groups. Loads and loads of people are mentioned. Only two does it say they walked with God, like Adam walked with God in the garden. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God for 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully, repeats it again, Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more because God took him away. There's only two people mentioned. The other one is Noah, uh, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now, what's interesting about those two people? They're the only two people we know were saved. One was raptured, and one was saved through that great tribulation of the wrath of God. Only two people saved, and they both walked with God as Adam walked with God in the garden. So they somehow had got back, Enoch and Noah, into a relationship and a place with God where they were walking with him so that they were raptured, they were taken to God, and they were saved. They're the only two. And they're the only two that are talked about as being uh, saved. We're not saying there weren't other people saved, but they're the only two that are specifically identified as that. So here we have these people walking with God. God's plan is to walk with you, but he wants to walk with you in the garden. Even if you, he wants you to go other places, he wants us to work with him and walk with him. Because remember, in the garden... Adam was put in the garden to work. He was put in the garden to do something. So not only did he talk with God in the garden, not only did he walk with God in the garden, he worked with God in the garden. Are you doing work for God? It's interesting that, isn't it? Because I'm sure most people here are doing some work, Yes, but we're not talking about work, work. We're talking about work in the garden. You see, Adam had work outside of the garden. He had to conquer the earth and subdue it. He had work in the world, but he also had work in the garden. Because God put Adam in the garden to work God's garden. You've got to draw a distinction 
between the work you do for yourself and the work you do for God. Now, there's obviously overlaps in this because all work that is done righteously, God can see. You know, even if you're just doing your normal job and you're doing it for the Lord and you're, you're you know, giving God out of the fruit of your labor, God sees all that and recognizes all that as work for him. But there is very clearly specific work in the garden. Remember, the garden is always called the garden of God in the Bible. Eden is called the garden of God very specifically, as we'll see in the coming months. What are you doing just for God that you get no benefit from? That's the real test, you see. The real test of when you're doing something for God is that you're not benefiting from it. You're doing it purely as a sacrifice. Sacrifice is always the test of real service to God. You see, we can all do things we enjoy. We can all do things that other people you know, praise us for or we get our reward from the appreciation of other people. Preaching can be like that. Uh, music ministry can be like that because people see it and appreciate it. But, but there has to be a continual sacrifice it, to make sure that it's genuine work for God. That's what the God, that's what the, the garden is about. Okay, so we see these things in the garden. We're going to look at these things over the coming weeks. So the bride is in the garden. You see, really, let's just bring the conclusion of this 10 week series to the beginning. The garden is the church. Yeah? We'll, we'll see that throughout the Bible. The kingdom, is, oh, that's the world. God's kingdom is going to go everywhere. But his garden is the church. We'll see that when we look at the Song of Songs. Because God calls his bride his garden. Yeah? You are a garden, my beloved. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. We will see that the garden is the church. It's the place where God dwells. Well, God only dwells in his church, right? His influence is all over the world because he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. But he's only in his church. He's in the garden. He's walking in the garden. Well, God's everywhere. No, he's walking in the garden. That's what the Bible says. Yeah, but I can meet with God everywhere. No, that isn't what it says. You can only meet with God in the garden. Now, that doesn't mean you can only meet with God when you're in a church building. Obviously, that's not what we're saying. You can meet with God anywhere. But God's garden is his people. Just as God came into the garden, so by his Holy Spirit, he comes into you. And he dwells in us. The Holy Spirit comes on the church and dwells in the church. That's the clear principle of uh, the New Testament where the Holy Spirit dwells. The church is the temple. And we'll see later that the temple is also a picture of the garden. We'll look at that. So even in Song of Songs, eight times God talks about his garden specifically. It's amazing how often God talks about the garden. When people are talking to God, he reminds them about the garden. When people want an answer, he tells them about the garden. When people need something from God, he tells them about the garden. When people say, I need this God, he actually says, we'll get in the garden. Because that's my plan. I created a garden for you. That is where you're supposed to be. That's where the river of life is that will separate into four parts because the number four is the number of creation. God wants us to go into all of creation. But it has to start in the garden. You've got to get in the river like Ezekiel did in his vision. That's where the tree of life is. The tree of life is always a picture of Jesus. Trees are always a picture of people in the Bible. We'll look at the trees in the coming weeks. But you can't eat from the tree of life unless you're in the garden. That's where the fruit is. We've already read it there. Genesis chapter 2. You may eat from all the fruit except one. Notice how Satan twists that and makes out God's restricting you. Oh, you can't do any of that. You can only do this one thing. He turns it totally around. What God actually says is, you can eat everything except that. The sinful nature. You can do everything, but not anything that comes from the sinful nature. The knowledge of good and evil. That will kill you. But everything else you can do. It's not actually restriction. It's freedom. In Christ, you are free. You're not restricted. So there's all these things. Jesus is in the garden. 
which might sound obvious, but who's walking in the garden? It's not the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit hasn't got legs, and it's got, not God the Father, because he's never described in that way. The only one of the Trinity who took on bodily form and became flesh is Jesus, so it's Jesus in the garden. So you've got all these things in the garden, the bride's in the garden. Work and ministry comes out of the garden. And Satan's in the garden. How annoying is that? Have you know, he's not in the garden at the end though. He's tied up and bound and cast into the lake of fire before the final garden. But at this present time, Satan's in the garden. Did you know Satan's in church this morning? Did you know that? Do you know you might be sat next to him? That's a scary thought, isn't it? Look to the person next to you. It's no good because you'd not recognize him anyway. Because people were sat next to Judas and they, 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 they thought he were a great guy. He were helping with the tea afterwards. Not that the person helping with the tea is <laughs> Judas. You know, they thought he were wonderful, but he wasn't. Satan was there at the table. Satan comes to church. Satan always gets in the garden. It's not the only voice in the garden. It's not just the voice of God speaking to us in the garden. Satan comes into the garden as well. Whilst we're in this dispensation, he will be removed eventually. But always remember that. We'll look at that as well when we come into it. So there's all these things in the garden. But the main thing that we know about the garden, Genesis 3 and verse 23, I believe. Genesis 3, verse 23. Is that despite God doing everything perfectly... Creating a perfect paradise, perfect people, perfect river, perfect trees, perfect animals. I mean, what a church to go to. I mean, just imagine that. Imagine having Adam as your pastor. Sinless. I mean, that is, you know, that's just awesome. The, the river of life is literally flowing. You know, not metaphorically, shall we come to the river today? Yeah, let's put on his trunks and get in. Fish in the river. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel's uh, prophecy that when the river of life flow, I'm just using this as an excuse to talk about fishing. You do know that, don't you? <laughs> that when the river of life flows out of the temple from the throne of God and it creates the river of life in the garden again, it says there's fish in it. Imagine going to church and you can go fishing. <laughs> I can't wait to get to heaven. There will be fishing in heaven. Jesus ate fish after the resurrection, so you can catch fish and eat them. It's in the Bible. You only ever ate fish. Stop talking about fishing. <laughs> perfect church, perfect environment, perfect place, but they still left the garden. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Can you see that, that? He was already working the ground in the garden. Yeah? But now, the curse is that outside of the garden, the ground was cursed, and work became toil and travail. And through the sweat of his brow, he would get his food. And weeds and thorns would come up. So he was now working under a curse. They left the garden. He drove the man out of the garden. He placed on the east side of the garden of Eden, Cherubim, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. They lost it. They lost, what did they lose? Did they lose their ability to hear God? No. Did they, did they lose their belief in God? No. Did they still give sacrifices to God? Yes. You read the story of Cain and Abel. So they brought up their children to worship God. And Cain and Abel brought sacrifices to God. So they're still doing, he's still working the ground like he did in the Garden of Eden. Can you see? Outwardly, nothing's changed. They're still, they're still believing God. They're still serving God. They're still doing similar things. Yeah, but they're not in the same place. They've left it. They've left the place because of their own choice, because of their own sin, because of their own will, because of their own selfishness, because of their own pride, because they've been deceived, all the things. They, 
weren't in the place God had prepared for them. They were now somewhere else, and that would bring a curse. I think this is perhaps the main thing I want us to understand. You see, I never have a problem, and you will all know this if you've known me for a long time, uh, I always ask people the same, play, same thing. Any member of this church, anyone who comes, I always say the same thing. Has God put you here? Because he, he might not have. He might want you to be somewhere else. You have to know that. Because if you're in the wrong place, it doesn't matter how, how well I preach, how well the leaders organize the church, how lovely everybody is, if you're not in the right place, you will not be under God's blessing. You have to be in the place. God put Adam in the place. He left it because of his own choice, his own disobedience, his own rebellion. But he now was not going to inherit the promise. Someone else would now have to come and open the garden again. That would be Jesus Christ. But the same process would still be followed. You've still got to obey Jesus, the same as Adam had to obey Jesus in the garden. You can still disobey Jesus, still say you believe in Jesus and go and do what you want and lose everything again. So they lost it. Paradise lost. They didn't lose their belief in God. They didn't lose their activities, but they weren't in the place God had put them. What's the place? It's the meeting place where God had put them to meet in the presence of God in the community God had put them with. Notice when, when they left, they, were, you know, they still had their friends that they had in the garden. Yeah, but they weren't meeting in the place where God had put them. So, the story of the Bible in many ways is God trying to get us back to the garden. Now, it's God that does this. You've no chance of getting back to the garden. You know, we can't find our way around the block. You're never going to find your way back to Eden. I think that's why no one really knows where Eden is. Although I've got a suspicion I think I know where it is, but I would have, wouldn't I? Yeah. No one knows where it is, but Dave thinks he knows where it is. But it's just, it's just a theory. I might not be right. Uh, did you hear that, darling? I might not be right. <laughs> Don't you dare say that's the first time ever. God's plan is to get us back to this place. That's what the Bible's all about. Now, at the end in Revelation, the place is there. It's open again. But the Spirit and the Bride are still saying, Come, come where? To the garden. And whoever wants, let them drink freely from the river of life. Let them eat from the tree of life. Jesus gets us back into the garden. All the curse is over. He's opened the way. He took us back into the garden. But you've still got to do it. Adam and Eve did do it, but still blew it. Just because Jesus has done everything doesn't mean you've got it. It's by faith we inherit the promises, we're told in Scripture. Can we see that? And so God's story is continually getting people. So after all this has gone wrong, he takes Enoch to heaven, he takes Noah and saves him. But then when Noah comes back down, at the same time Noah's still alive, God picks another man. What's he called? At the same time of Noah, he's called Abraham. You do know Abraham was around at the same time as Noah. No? If you read some extra biblical books like Jasher and Jubilees, actually Abraham and Noah were good friends. So he takes Abraham and he, he fulfills the same pattern. We've just read it in Genesis chapter 12. Right, Abraham, I'm going to take you back to the garden. I'm going to take you back to the land where all the promises are. I'm going to get you to return, because he was living in Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees. Chaldea is southern Babylon. I'm going to get you out of here, and I'm going to take you back to the original plan. And so he took Abraham back to the garden, back to the promised land. And every one of the children of Israel, that's what they promise was. I'm taking you back to the promised land. So the first five books of the Bible is the story of God taking the Israelites to the promised land. The promised land, when you read it in the Bible, is always a description of the garden. We'll look at that in a minute. 
So God's plan is to get us back to the garden. Can we see this? Do we believe this? Are you going back to the garden? Oh, I believe in God in my own way. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. They all believed in God in their own way. The question is, are you coming back to the garden? Now, in the Bible, there are many prophecies that the garden is being restored. And we know that through Jesus Christ, that he restored us back access into paradise. In fact, the day he died, what did he say to the thief on the cross? Today you will be with me in paradise. The, the word paradiso, it's a Persian word. It literally means a walled garden. That's what it means. It's the same it's the Greek word for the Hebrew word gan, garden. Jesus said, the last thing he said before he died is, today you'll be back in the garden. You'll be back with me in the garden. Why? Because he was reaching out to Jesus in a relationship. So Jesus says, you'll be back with me in community. You'll be in the place where God's people. So in the New Testament, that word paradiso is always a picture of the garden. So when Paul was caught up to heaven in Corinthians, what did he say? I was caught up to heaven? No. I was caught up to paradiso. I was caught up into the garden. Paul described heaven as a garden. Now, some people think that's not the fullness of heaven, that's a preparation place, which may be so, but it's still paradise, it's still the garden. So we've got these promises of restoration. The Bible continually reminds us and promises us that he's taking us back to the garden. Numbers 24 and, and uh, verse 5. Numbers chapter 4, verse 5. So when the children of Israel are on the march through the desert, the desert's not a garden, have you noticed that? The desert is an opposite of the garden. The desert is a place of death and a wasteland. Number, number 24, Numbers chapter 24, verse 5. So this was a prophecy. Now the strange thing about this prophecy, this is being given by Balaam, son of Balak, who's actually uh, being paid to curse Israel. So this is an enemy describing God's people. As they're marching through the desert to the promised land, this is how he describes God's people. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. You, you see, you've got to be in a tent. Yeah. God's garden, we live in tents, so you need to practice now. How beautiful are your tents, Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel, like valleys they spread out, like gardens beside a river, like aloes planted by the Lord, like the cedars beside the waters. The prophet describes the people of God when they're living in community, when they're camped around the Holy Spirit, the temple of God. The prophets describe them, you're like a garden. What kind of garden? A garden that's full of trees by the rivers. It's a picture of the Garden of Eden. So even the enemies of God recognize that the community of God, the church in the wilderness as it was at that time, the church is the garden. The people, not the building. The people. We are the garden. So they had the prophetic promise that they were becoming Back to the garden. They're meeting together. They're following Moses. They're becoming the garden. They're going to go into the garden, which is what the promised land was called. So if you go to Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 9, you'll find the very words from God himself. Moses reiterating the words of God. Deuteronomy 11 and verse 9. So he says, look, now you're meeting together. Now you're in community. Now the presence of God is with you. You've heard the prophets. You are now becoming the garden. So I'm taking you into the promised land so that you will live long in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. The land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt. You're not slaves building with bricks. 
from which you have come when you planted your seed and irrigated it by foot as in the vegetable garden. It's not like the Egypt garden. But the land you are crossing, the Jordan, to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks in the rain from heaven. Let's read down. It is a land the Lord your God cares for. It's the only land that God ever says is his. Which is strange because the Bible tells us the earth, all the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But he only calls one specific place his. This is my land, which is the promised land. The Lord your God cares for it. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. So if you faithfully obey the commands I am giving you today to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I will send rain on your land in the season and the spring rains and they will yield the harvest in this garden. So God is taking them to this garden and this is where we get confused. Because when I, or, or the word garden is said to us, what do you think of? I mean, I just think of my garden at home, 10 metres by 10 metres. You know, a few, few flowers to keep Carolyn happy. You know, tomatoes and radish and leeks and onions and I grow vegetables and grass and a bunny rabbit to keep Jemima happy. And, you know, my nice little garden. That's nice, isn't it? You've all got, you all like your garden. For me, the garden's one of the most important bits of the house. Yeah, but it's a bit small, that, isn't it? But that's how most of us think. We think about just our little plot. And God says, no, no, it's not like the garden in Egypt. That was slavery mentality. You've got a little garden. I'm just, I just look after my garden. No, God says, my garden is, is uh, several thousand square miles. It's huge. It's got valleys and rivers and mountains and it, it drinks in and it's got streams and fish and animals. It's, it's huge. It's like the Lake District. You spend your lifetime exploring my garden. Oh, no, I just, just like to sit in my deck chair. Smell me daffodils. No, 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 you can't. You can't have small thinking. It's God's garden. It's a lot bigger than you think. It involves a lot more than you think it does. We can't. You see, when we talk about church, we all like our little church, don't we? You know, we like to be comfortable in our own seats, songs we're familiar with, you know, preacher that we half trust, you know, all this stuff. You know, make sure we've got a car parking spot. You know, we, don't, we like our little garden, we like our comfort, we like things to fit in with what our idea of a small garden is. And he's saying, no, it's not like, it's not like Egypt where you've got your little vegetable plot. No, it's a huge nation. It's massive. Oh, I just like me 10 meters by 10 meters. I just want to stay in my own plot. No, the promises for us are huge. God's garden's massive. But here's where the trouble happens. We're not sure if we want that garden. We want a garden that fits into our thinking, not God's thinking. God says, well, this is my, I care for this land. I want you to be involved in this land. I want you to own mountains and rivers and streams and fields and thousands of square miles of property. Oh, oh. I don't want to cope with that. I'll just do my own little bit in my own way. I once heard someone say, if you can cope with what you're doing, you're not doing what God wants you to do. Because what God asks you to do will always mean you have to totally rely upon him by faith to get it done, because otherwise you'll never believe it can be done. And whilst that's true in our own individual lives, can I tell you, it's very true of the church mentality, especially in a small village. We think we're here just to do our little thing. No, we're not. We're here to spread out into God's garden. Yeah, I was on a, a, a conference conversation Yesterday, I didn't, not, I didn't go to a conference, you know, on, you can do them on Skype or on the telephone. And I was on the conference to uh, Native Americans in North Dakota. Who knows where North Dakota is? You'd have to look at, I know you do, I showed you where it was yesterday. <laughs> it's, it's on the border of Canada and, uh, and America. Most Americans don't know where North, have never been to North Dakota. And I was talking to... Uh, um, 
Jeremy stands over Bull, who's one of the tribal leaders, and uh, Russell stands over Bull, who's one of the tribal chiefs of this area in Dakota, and Bobby Gray Eagle. It's like watching a Western. <laughs> I'm talking to all these people. I couldn't see them. I, I, I were doing it on a, on a phone link. And they're saying, oh, Pastor Dave's here. And I was talking to two other of their leaders, and they were saying, talk to us, Pastor Dave. And, and they knew all about me because they'd been watching the Revelation Bible studies in North Dakota, the tribal people, the Native Americans there. And they've invited me to come and speak at their conference they're doing in April. And by God's providence, I am there. And they're doing it. I'm going to do a conference for Cleddy in April. And I'm there all week, and I'm preaching every day except two days I'd left free to get some rest. And they're doing this conference on those two days. And I suddenly thought, God's garden's a lot bigger than I thought it was. You know, these, these people, I was talking to some of them, and I was asking about where they live, and they say, oh, I just live on 70,000 acres. Oh, okay. <laughs> what, is that your garden? Yeah. They don't even have a fence around it. They're just like, you know, as far as you can see to the mountains, that's what I own. That's our native tribal land. And it's very hard for our Western small-minded mentality to grasp that. How do you mow the lawn? <laughs> do, you get, do you get the kids to do it? Like, oh, no, we just get some buffalo in and they, oh, yeah, good idea. <laughs> but you see, churches like that, do you know why churches stagnate and fail to grow? Because they limit the garden that what God's actually put them in. I've been sharing you now a while, and I've been sharing it with the trustees for the last three years, even before this started to happen, that God has told me my ministry, I have to travel more. And it's like, now, I'm getting to the point now where I can accommodate that, I can see that and believe it. It took me a while to readjust to that thinking. I don't know whether the church will adjust to that. You might want to sack me because I'm not here as much. Not that you employ me, but that's the small-minded thinking. You work for me. No, we all work for the Lord. There weren't enough amens then. Amen. Because I, I know this church. You know, I know it, how it can have that mentality of, <clears throat> no, the pastor has to be here for my little garden to make sure I'm okay. No, the church is here. The garden's here. We're all here for each other. Don't limit people when God is calling people to do things. We have to obey God in his garden. God will then make things grow and get people to move into different ministries. This year, I'm not uh, taking, we're not, we're not doing a mission trip as a church to Kenya. Yes, we are. It's just I'm not leading it. There are still mission trips going to Kenya. Carla's going, where's Carla gone? Is she upstairs with the kids? Carla's going on the medical mission with One by One. Joseph and Ruth are going on a mission in, is it June? Uh, Libby's gone to South Africa. Any of you are free to join in with these missions now. We, we can't, you can't just wait for me to say, I'll take you. God might be prompting you to go. We go with people we trust, people we know, relationships. That's why Lee, Wayne and I went to India to build relationships and hopefully people can go out to India and work with Kimmy and, and our, our contacts out there. Don't look for, to me to have to take you. That's small garden mentality. God's much bigger than that. We have to start moving out into the things God called us to. His garden is very big. Do we believe that? Look at Isaiah 51, verse 3. Isaiah prophesied that if they would obey, if they would follow Then the Lord would surely comfort Zion and will look with compassion on all her ruins <clears throat> and he will make the deserts like Eden. He will make the wastelands like the garden of the Lord, the garden of God. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and the sound of singing. Isaiah is saying, look, if you'll obey, if you'll step out and do the things, although it might appear a wasteland, God will actually turn the wasteland into the garden of God. Although it might appear a desert, he will turn the desert into the garden of Eden. You see, when the Israelites left, where did they go? Into a desert. You see, when you obey God, your natural eyes will say, this isn't going to work. 
We're going to die in the desert. What did the children of Israel say? We're going to die in a desert. And God kept saying, no, you won't. I'm going to be a garden amongst you. He fed them and watered them all the time, didn't he? He created the garden. The temple is a picture of the garden. Till he got them into the promised land, most of them never got there. Why? They only saw the desert. They only saw the wasteland. They only saw the problems. Till eventually God had to agree with them. It's a very dangerous thing when God agrees with you. You're supposed to agree with what he said. But if you complain and nag and grumble and just continually nah, 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 at God, eventually God will say, okay, have it your way. Die. If, if that's what you want, die in the desert. But that's not the garden. The garden's over here. And we've seen enough people die in the desert because they've rebelled, complained, but that's not God's plan. God's plan is to get us back to the garden. That's what his plan has always been. That's why in Revelation 2 and verse 7, the promise to the church was very clear. Revelation 2, verse 7. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to the one who is victorious, to the one who overcomes. I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradiso of God. To the one who overcomes. Now remember, he's talking to the churches. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. If you really grasp what God's saying, if you have the faith to do that, if you believe and overcome, then you will enter the paradise of God and you will eat from the tree of life. You will be restored back to the garden. Now, did everyone in that church believe in God? Yes. Well, they wouldn't be there. During a time of persecution, they wouldn't have gone to church unless they really believed in God. But he still says you've got to overcome. You've got to obey. You've got to follow me. But we know the problems. We know the things that happened. We know what went wrong. They disobeyed. Just like Adam and Eve did. They sinned. They rebelled. And so the problems happened. So in Lamentations chapter 2 and verse 6, Lamentations is written when they realize they've disobeyed and everything's gone wrong and they're lamenting, saying, oh no, what have we done? They would have to go through a lifetime now of 70 years of captivity because of disobedience. God laid waste his dwelling like a garden. He has destroyed the place of his meeting. God would never do that, would he? Well, he did. God would never throw his people out of the garden, would he? Well, he did. God would never take the Israelites out of Egypt and then not let them get to the garden, would he? Well, he did. The Lord has made Zion forget her appointed festivals and her Sabbaths. His fierce anger has spurned both Lord and priest. They were so disobedient to God. They rebelled against him so much. They were so stubborn in their grumbling and complaining and disobedience. Eventually God says, okay, you're not coming into the garden. You're just not going to get it. You know, you will die not having achieved, not having inherited what God had called you to achieve. Now, there's an interesting fact. When the Babylonians came, this is mentioned several times in Scripture. It's just an illustration. There in Jeremiah 39 and verse 4. The thing about this verse is it's repeated several times. So you think God's trying to prove a point when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and the soldiers saw them, they fled. They left the city at night by way of the king's garden. Every time you read about them running away from the Babylonians, when God brought his judgment on them, you find the same thing in uh, chapter 52 and verse 7. Chapter 52 and verse 7. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Then the city wall was broken through. The whole army fled. They left the city at night through the gate between the two walls, the king's garden. You find it. God always points out that they ran through the garden. So the last place they left was the king's garden. Now that's not a coincidence that God always mentions that because he mentions it in other places. When they disobeyed and ran away, the last thing they remember leaving was the garden. In their minds... The last time they were in God's place, God's presence, God's holy city of Zion, is when they were in the garden, and that was the last place they left. They ran away. 
and they fled towards the Arabah, the, the, the Arabah down in uh, southern Israel. There's the Negev and the Arabah, they're wasteland deserts. You will die if you run into that. You won't get out of that. You won't get through it. You'll die of thirst before you've got through the desert. But the Babylonians captured them because it was God's curse. Instead of obeying in the garden, they rebelled. So they lost the garden, just like Adam and Eve lost the garden, just like the children of Israel lost the garden. And what's really interesting is when they came back 70 years later, Nehemiah chapter 3 and verse 15, the fountain gate was repaired by Shalom, son of called Heze, the ruler of the district of Mizpah. He rebuilt it, roofing over it, putting its doors and bolts in place. He also repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam by the king's garden, as far as the steps going down from the city of David. God made sure that they repaired the garden, the king's garden. Can you see that? You don't get away from understanding the garden. Now they may say, what are we repairing a garden for? We haven't got a city. What do we need a garden for? Well, you do. You've got to repair the garden, the king's garden, by the pool of Siloam, which was the place of cleansing even in the time of Jesus. So if they didn't repair that and the pool of Siloam, when Jesus came, there would have been no cleansing for Messiah to come. Remember, Jesus sent people to the pool of Siloam to be cleansed. Some of us have been to the pool of Siloam. And they've just uncovered the steps going down and up to the temple. Next time we go to Israel, you can actually walk now from the pool of Siloam underground on the actual pavement that Jesus and the disciples walked up to the temple. They've only uncovered it in the past few years. But now you can walk on it. So we'll look at that next time we go to Israel. So can we see? God's plan is the garden. God's not going to change his mind. You can't get away from it. You can't run away, run out of the garden. You've, you've got to come back. You've got to be where the garden is. This is what God's plum, promise has always been. This is what we're going to look at over the next few weeks. I don't know for how long, but God's plan is for us to be in the garden where there is life, where there is fruitfulness, but it means we have to obey. Okay then, so this morning I just want us to focus on that. So even as we come around the table, remember what the table represents. Remember what the body and the blood represent. Remember what the wine and the bread represent. Because even when God reminds us about the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, he ties it to the garden. John chapter 19, verse 41. John chapter 19, verse 41. When Jesus' body was whipped and broken and crucified, when they took his body, where did they put his body? At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. Why does it tell us that? Why did it just say they put him in a tomb? No, 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 no. No, it has to be in a garden. Because God's plan is to get us all back into the garden. So the body of Jesus had to be put in the garden. Some of us have been to the garden tomb in Israel. In a garden. And in the garden a new tomb on which no one had ever been laid. So Jesus, the, God emphasizes it twice there, the body of Jesus is put in a garden. Why? Because the body of Christ is the church. God wants the church back in the garden. That's why his body was put in the garden. Where did Jesus rise and get the resurrection life that he gives to the church? In the garden. Who saw that? Those who went to the garden. When we're taking the body, we're saying, I want to come back to the garden. I want to be in the garden, part of the body of Christ. But even the blood, even the blood that was shed, it's interesting in the Bible. The only once when he was on the cross does he actually mention uh, his blood. And that was after he died when the Roman put a spear in his side and blood and water flowed, right, after his death. But while he was alive, only once does it say his blood was shed. Luke 22 and verse 44. When Jesus entered the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke 22 and verse 44. 
He came into the garden and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his, his, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the floor. Why did the blood have to fall in the garden? The body had to be in the garden. The blood had to be in the garden. Because God's plan is to get us into the garden. He cleanses the garden again. The blood of Jesus doesn't just take away your sin. It cleanses the garden so that we can now have access to God again. So when we take the body, when we take the blood, when we take the bread, when we take the wine, we're remembering that God is saying, come back into the garden. That's why it's linked to the garden in the Gospels. So even when we take that this morning, remember that. It's granting us access back into the garden. It's not just about salvation. It's also about inheritance, fruitfulness, and all the promises God had for you even before you were born because he wants to put you back in the garden like he put Adam and Eve in the garden in the first place. That's what God's plan is for us. Can the team come up, please? We're going to worship the Lord, and we're going to decide when we take the body and when we take the blood, when we take the bread and when we take the wine, do you want to come back into the garden? Do you want to obey? Do you want to follow God? Do you want God's garden, which is much more than you think it is? The choice is always ours. But God's plan doesn't change. And Jesus' will doesn't change. He wants us in the garden with him. We're going to see that over the coming weeks. But you make your choice again this morning. Do you want to follow him into the garden? where his body was put, where his blood opened the way. The choice is ours. Let's remember the garden. Let's remember our Savior as we take the bread and as we take the wine and remember Jesus. Can the stewards come out, please? The team are going to lead us in a song of worship. Let's remember the Lord.